Hey, listeners. At the time that we recorded this podcast with Jason Price, he wasn't aware that his game would be nominated for an Emmy Award. Rach and I also didn't know that Plus One Forward would be nominated for a Best Podcast Emmy. Voting is live as of this episode's release. Please, Follow the link in the show notes and vote for us. Vote for A Complicated Profession. Vote for Plus One Forward. Vote for all the games that you love. Thank you for your time. Welcome to Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the apocalypse engine. This episode continues our summer series about Firebrand's games. I'm your co-MC, Rich. And I'm your co MC, Rach. Tonight, we're joined by our guest, Jason Price of Always Checkers Publishing. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hi there. Thanks for having me. How long have you been playing Firebrands games? What was your gateway? So I'd say I've been playing Firebrands games for a couple of years. So not a really long time, but enough to experience a few of them. I suppose my gateway game was actually one that was uh, my regular gaming group kind of brought to the table, which is a game called Stewpot. Hmm. Mm. I think you might even be interviewing the creator in another interview. It just might be. Spoilers, gosh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I was aware of Firebrands, the original game, and it's actually very relevant to my interest as kind of a mecha game, but we hadn't played mm-hmm. it yet. So it was Stewpot that we played, and something about it just really, really clicked with our group. We had a really amazing time with it. It kind of opened my eyes to a particular genre and, and inspired me to write a game myself. It was quite heavily based on, on that at first, and then over time it evolved to be something that I think is kind of its own thing now but it was yeah definitely street pot that inspired me originally very cool and thanks to your game group for bringing in that new and different there that is really cool yeah they're very well, open to the, trying new systems and and just fun i mean it was kind of one shots in between larger campaigns mm-hmm. it used to be just a filler when someone was away or when you just wanted a break from the kind of the ongoing campaigns but it kind of turned into we just enjoyed them so much that we went through a, a phase of doing a new game every few weeks and really short campaigns and just experimental things like that. And we kind of continue that nowadays as well. That sounds really, really cool. Well, let's jump on over here to setting up. Setting up. In setting up, our guests will discuss some aspect of Firebrands, tabletop play, or game culture that they want to put a spotlight on. Jason, you had suggested before the show that you feel Firebrands leans into a style of play that might be different from your typical role-playing game. Yeah, I I was particularly interested in the idea that it lends itself to kind of episodic games, uh, almost like you could compare it to a TV show, like a sitcom, like a Saturday morning cartoon, where you're kind Mm -hmm. of getting these self-contained, very thematic episodes of play which have got their own idea and their own setup and you sort of focus in on that one fun idea and you, and you play around with that obviously with your characters having freedom to do what they want within that scene and you kind of take the resources available to you and you make a fun story i think in original firebrands it's more sort of question based like prompts uh, around a particular mm-hmm. action scene in, in stewpot which is kind of more similar to a complicated profession obviously in, in stewpot it's like a tavern you've got an episode in a tavern in my game it's part of the intergalactic cruise that you're on and like a funny event that happens and you can pick them off a menu when you play and I just think there's not many games that actually really heavily lean into that idea of playing with like a recurring cast and I can't really describe any better than a sitcom. It's something that's come through in the feedback since releasing the game as well that people really really got that and they really enjoy that idea. I wonder if that has something to do with Firebrand's games not necessarily being focused on the progression of your character. I think that's a really good point. There's definitely an element of progress in that. I mean, in my game, your, your character sort of changes and they, they evolve, I suppose. But it's definitely not your classic gaining items, gaining levels. It's more of an evolution of your character and the, and the resources and skills available to you changing. But yeah, I do think that's part of the appeal. Uh, I think there's also an element of shifting time. So it's not a linear adventure where you start in the inn and then you go on the road and then you reach the dungeon. You can kind of just zoom in on these little snapshots and you can infer that things have happened in between. You know, time has passed in between. There's things that don't need Mm -hmm. to be played out. I can go to my game as an example. You you know, you do a cruise and you think you're going to play an entire cruise as part of the game. But actually, you just do a before the cruise, setting it up, meeting the passengers, three key moments from that cruise, and then arriving home and dropping them off again. 
you can infer that you do things like launch the ship and you could be out in this cruise for as long as you like. It doesn't really matter. It's more about the key events that happen and that's what you zoom in on. I think it lends itself to one-shot play and brevity, which was something that our group really wanted from games. We didn't want to play a game that couldn't be played in at least two evenings. No one really wants to play the part of the cruise where you're sitting in the auditorium and they're talking about how to use the lifeboats. No, I think I just think, yeah, there wasn't much humor to be had there. <laughs> well, now you've said it, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that was a missed opportunity. <laughs> Whole indie game about explaining to the crew and the passengers. No, please don't write that. Jason, one of the things that I'm noticing coming in to Firebrand's games with not much experience is that there's no advancement. The games don't necessarily care about that. And I think that that does open things up to more episodic type content. It's, you have to keep progressing threats if you have advancement within your mechanics. But if you don't have advancement, then the growth of the characters happens purely from the fiction at the table, right? Yeah, I agree. In, in fact, one thing that drew me to Stewpot and then obviously my own game was the idea that you could play a non-violent game. Mm -hmm. Although there are obvious tropes in bounty hunting, like a kind of an ongoing war and, mm -hmm. and people trying to invade the ship and things like that. Actually, the solutions that are available to you, because it's very freeform, you could actually play the game almost more like a slice of life game where you kind of invite them in for a party rather than shoot them. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it, you know, I'm being facetious, but the idea was there that you could play the game non-violently and it really appealed to me. I think slice of life as a genre is one that, again, it's a growing genre. I think people like the idea that you can create something and you can play around in it and you don't necessarily have to be fighting monsters and gaining levels and, and gaining loot in the same way that a lot of other games do already, probably with a lot more years of research and to make it as best as it can be. It's the, the challenge. challenge. In Challenges, our guest will talk about a specific Firebrand's game that they have designed. We brought Jason on here to talk about a complicated profession, which Rach and I, being Star Wars nerds that we are, that phrase is a lot of weight. But the payoff, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jason, if you could, tell us a little bit about a complicated profession. What's it about? So, A Complicated Profession is about a team of bounty hunters who have disbanded, basically, because bounty hunting has become a bit obsolete. Technology has kind of overtaken the need for it. In my game, there's drones and surveillance and everything. It's just kind of reduced the need for bounty hunters to go out and find people and hunt them down anymore. So, this once successful crew have disbanded, gone their own separate ways for a while, and then one of the crews had an idea that there's a need for running a cruise ship in this dangerous galaxy. <laughs> the, the big corporations don't want to do it. It's too dangerous, but there's the demand for it. There's an audience. So therefore, they try and get the crew back together for one last attempt at working together, despite what they've been doing in the meantime. And they start a new life together on the cruise ship. Uh, so that's the basic idea. But uh, the game itself is you run this ship, you create your world and your ship and your characters, and you've got your old jobs and your new jobs. And as you play, you get passengers who come to you with, and they've got contracts and they want certain things from these contracts. They might want to just go out and have a party on board or they might want to go and learn more about the galaxy. You draw cards to kind of figure out and generate what it is they're after. And then you pick events off a menu and then you play through these kind of key events that happen on the ship. And the, as with all sort of sitcom ideas, things go wrong and you have to kind of deal with them using your skills You've got a combination of your old bounty hunter skills and, and your new mm -hmm. host skills. And as you play, you'll start using up your old skills. They'll disappear and you'll eventually sort of embrace your new role and, and become a fully fledged host. In the setting up section of the show, you were alluding to this game being a bit more of a slice of life game. How is the balance between the non-violent aspects of slice of life and the violent backgrounds of these characters? I didn't want to give everybody bounty hunter skills which were great at killing people or, or using weapons i just it just wasn't the feel that i wanted to go for with this game there is an element of that because of the subject matter mm -hmm. only one of the original host jobs is an actual bounty hunter the rest of them are more like the sidekicks so you've got like the hired muscle and the doctor and the lucky companion there's eight different roles that loosely fit into the idea of someone you could imagine being on a bounty hunter ship and star wars for example and so the the range of skills 
I tried to make sure that there's an element of humour in them, like things that might be relevant to running a crew, is like talking about your your medals that you've earned as a pilot, or turning up in the right place as a lucky companion just at the right time, things like that. So very few of the skills relate to actual doing harm to somebody, um, but it's hard to completely ignore that. And, and certain scenarios will come up that that you could choose to go that way if your group wanted to do that. What mechanics are different in this game versus Firebrands? OG Firebrands. Yeah, I think OG Firebrands, uh, in my mind, is very much focused on the prompt questions and the idea that each game that you play has a set of questions you answer. And I think my game definitely has that element to it, almost as like to set up the event that you play. But there's a bit more of, I'd say, freeform roleplay where you're kind of given a scenario and that scenario might be, this, you know, we'll call it a complication. Something something goes wrong in the middle of the event and all of your characters must discuss together how they're going to deal with this scenario using their skills. And you're rewarded for using your skills and you're rewarded for using items and resources that you've gained on your ship. And then at the end of the event, you'll roll a few dice and you'll be given rewards based on how well you dealt with the scenario. Obviously, it comes down to luck, but you can kind mm-hmm. of weight it in your favor by using these different skills. And I think that element of it is probably what makes it different to Firebrands. It's not so much of a prompt question game. It's not even so much of a, a mini game game. It's more freeform role play with with some questions thrown in as well to sort of uh, give you some direction and give you something to get the ball rolling so you're not just stuck there saying, what are we going to do? That is really interesting. It is quite a departure from the Firebrands framework. Yeah, I'd, I'd say also the way that a complicated profession works is it's very procedural in terms of everything builds on each other so you do the setup and in setup you establish your characters you choose some skills and then you move on to getting your ship and then you move on to getting a contract and some passengers and then each contract you play is very much you do these four things and you do that several times and it's, it's like a ritual and that's how the game works each session is based around a very specific order of things it actually it's a lot longer than firebrands i would say hmm. i think firebrands you can probably play it a lot quicker I mean, you, maybe you could call it bloat. It's it's things that, as I designed the game, I just wanted to add into a complicated profession because I liked the idea. Perhaps it's not as streamlined as Firebrands, but I did want to make something that was recognisable as its own idea. And I think the way that contracts run and, and the fact you have a ship that you essentially add items to, I think that's really the thing that defines a complicated profession as, as something that's different. The resources available to you, that's really what, I think they're the star of the show when in my own playtesting the idea that you as a player can create anything essentially and put it on the ship and if you can find a use for it you're rewarded for using it I actually found that it was very challenging to create a game where you can put anything on a ship I mean there's so so many hilarious stories of the initial playtest <laughs> where where we realized the flaws in the system <laughs> so someone would create an item that was too powerful and then in every event the solution was always we'll just use that item so it ended up you had to put rules in to kind of restrict the amount of times you could use things in order to give you the freedom to create whatever you want. And eventually I added prompts to direct you as to what kind of items you might want to add. But there's, there's, a very, there's definitely room in, in this game to create things and then you'll find a way to make use of them. And it's all recorded on a, on a sheet so you've kind of got this artifact of play at the end which I really like of this ship where you've got decorations and useful items and crew members you've picked up along the way. For me personally, that's what I really enjoy. The idea that you, you can play your game and at the end you've got this sheet, that sh- your ship, which shows everything you've done. You've got this little history of your game. And I think that's always really nice to look back on. Sticking with mechanics, when you're in a scene in a complicated profession and the outcome of attempting to do a thing, an action, a conversation, when that is unclear, how do you resolve that? You said that it was freeform. Is it purely freeform generally every event will introduce some questions for the main player to answer and that Mm -hmm. person will then sort of set up the game you'll kind of often go through a list of things such as you know what all of the crew wearing what you're doing to entertain the passengers at this moment what's the big thing happening outside the ship for example and so you kind of have a, a lot of setup and then you'll be answering that as part of the game and then something will happen and that's the freeform bit where it will say okay, so suddenly uh, something explodes on the ship and all the passengers are doing this, and therefore, how are you going to resolve this? And so it's down to you as the players to look at the items and resources available to you, to look at your skills, and to basically come up with a sort of a solution amongst yourselves. So there is an element of 
it helps if someone is leading the game, but it's definitely GM-less in terms of there is not one person who is running it. Everybody can add their solution and then you'll tend... I mean, at least in my playtesting, you find that people tend to build on each other's story. That's the goal. That's what I say in, mm-hmm. in, the, in the game text. You know, anybody can start to provide a solution, but try to build on their story. Explain exactly what your character's doing, even if you are not directly involved in the solution. Just explain what they're doing. It could be something completely different and that's often the funniest thing they could be doing in, in a moment of crisis mm-hmm. so that's the way that we've resolved it is that the stakes are low if one person solves it by themselves it doesn't really matter as long as you yourself are explaining what your, what your character is doing that's probably gives you more of a picture of what would be happening in this kind of scenario than trying to band together and do it yourself does that answer your question sorry i'm not sure if that's a great answer to what you're asking it does but it feels like there's a scene resolution mechanic uh, so the scene resolution mechanic is a very simple dice rolling mechanic where the more items you use the more dice you get up up to a maximum of three basically and there's basically three tiers of of rewards for finishing an event Mm -hmm. if you roll badly then something goes wrong and you generally the lead player generally has to explain what's gone wrong maybe something happens to the passengers maybe they're unhappy but you as the lead player need to explain what's gone wrong and why it's gone wrong the kind of middle tier you've kind of passed the event you've met the criteria you get a decoration usually for the ship, which is something you can add as a memento of that event. But it's it's mm-hmm. non, it's non-functional. You might refer to it in scenes, but essentially it doesn't give you any bonuses in future. It's just like a token of what's happened for the artifact of play. And the top reward gives you an actual useful item or, or an NPC crew member. These are the things that you can actually use in scenes to gain more bonus dice. So when I say that the game builds and, and everything is procedural, you start off with not very much. And then by the end of the game, you've got so you've got a huge wealth of resources available to you, and I, and you've all generally become skilled hosts with your new skills. And I think that element of things snowballing as you play, I think that's quite fun as well. It, it changes, so it doesn't it keeps the game fresh as you play. In my opinion, you've always got something new to refer to. You, the solutions available to you, have grown so much that you, you know you might struggle for ideas in the first one, but that's part of the fun of it. You're a new crew. You've got a ship that. You're trying to attract passengers too. It might be a bit janky. And I like the idea that over time you, you kind of gain more resources so that, oh, well, obviously this is what we can do in this scenario now because we've got all this stuff and we've been so successful. I think that's something that appealed to me and I tried to build into the mm-hmm. resolution mechanics. That's really exciting. Whereas in Mobile Frame Zero, Firebrands, the mini games are called games. Here they're called main events. With that in mind, Jason, what's your favorite main event? in ACP and why it's hard to pick it's like picking your favorite child <laughs> it is and that's why we force you to this crucible yeah my personal favorite it's probably the one uh, where someone's having a birthday party on the ship but the idea is that this person has kept it secret that they're having a birthday party and you've got to explain why they've kept it a secret like why would you be having a birthday and not want anybody else to know I'm just having flashbacks of when you take <laughs> someone out to dinner and they're like, don't tell the wait staff, it's my birthday yeah. party. And they'll come in with a procession, <laughs> clapping and singing. Exactly. That's what I was going for completely. But of course, someone on the cruise, all the passengers are going to reveal that it's their birthday. And then it, it's the crew's job to give them a birthday party, whether they want one or not. And so you'll play through these different scenarios where someone's got to make a cake and someone's got to get the passengers to sing happy birthday. But you're a bit more restricted in terms of the amount of times you can use one of your own skills or or mm-hmm. resources on the ship so you've got to be very selective about how you fix it and obviously some of them will go wrong and each time you do one you have to roll some dice and sort of see how it's gone and there's it can go badly it can go really well but i just just as a concept i thought it was it was a fun concept and it always inspires people because everyone's been in that situation as you say where you don't want someone to know it's your birthday because you know they're going to make a big fuss about it and you really just want to keep it quiet to yourself <laughs> It's definitely a beautiful intersection of the bounty hunter investigative characters and the cruise ship sitcom environment. Oh, it just lit my mind on fire. (laughs) But I mean, I could talk about the various games for ages because at various events, I should say, for ages, because they, yeah, they're really, really fun to write. I think that was one of the things about using this system is that because you can just pick key events, it's so much fun just to come up with ideas and then to build on them and to to flesh them out and how would you approach this and, and what's funny about this idea or what's emotional about this idea there's other ones where it's about having a fight on the ship or there's ones where like a I suppose a more romantic scene although it's a bit more a comedy romance than a serious romance 
I just felt like it was really ripe for ideas, this whole concept. Well, I have to say, this has got me pretty excited about all of these cool main events. Why don't we jump over here and play one of those main events together? Jason, would you be up for that? Yeah, for sure. On your turn, pick a game. (laughs) In the challenges section of the show, our guests will run us a segment of Firebrand's play, or in this case, a segment of a complicated profession. All right, Jason, where do we start with a complicated profession? Okay, so for the purposes of a brief introduction to the game, I think we're going to skip most of the setup, which is kind of a game in itself. And we're just mm-hmm. going to head into one of the main events. So just to describe where we're at, our crew has met up again from whatever they were doing. We've banded together and we've started our, our new profession. We've got our ship, which we're calling the Plus One Forward. <laughs> Gotta stay on brand. Yep. We've managed to gain some passengers. So for the purposes of this contract, we've drawn some cards and we've decided that they are a famous sports team and their manager who are taking a trip with us before a big match they've got in this corner of the galaxy. We did roll up the lead passenger who for this purpose is going to be the manager. And the manager is Cheeto. He's an earnest kind of gelatinous species called a Hodma. And he's quite small as well. So uh, probably dwarfed by his sports team. Uh, and they've, <laughs> they've decided they want a thrill-seeking contract. So they want us to be risky with our choices, to be dangerous, uh, thrilling, and deadly, get close to any sort of disasters mm-hmm. we can. So I've got to pick one event for us to play out of the choice of nine. I'm going to go with one called Moonlight Sonata. I'll let you, Rach, take lead on this event, which means you can read it out. And that it should be quite self-explanatory. We'll just work our way through it. We'll answer some questions about what's happening. And obviously, we've got our own characters as well to kind of give us some choices. I don't know if you want to go through who you are. Sure. I will start with introducing my character. I will be playing Curtis yet again. Curtis is a former hacker. He is now the barkeep on the plus one forward. As for the event, to read it out, one of the highlights of your cruise is a special dinner dance organized by the crew. The captain also picks a passenger to lead the final dance with them. You must ensure a suitable view accompanies the dance with a big finale to end the evening. The first question I have is, what location have you chosen for the ship during the dinner dance? I think we're going to be taking it a safe but thrilling distance away from a star going supernova. It's going to provide our own light show. It's a good choice. I like the safe part. That's very wise. Safe but thrilling. (laughs) Rich... What will happen outside of the ship during the finale to impress the passengers? Well, the start going supernova, of course, there is a particular calculation that one of our busted droids told us that there will be a certain brilliant display of color during this cycle. And if we time it right, it will happen right at, uh, when the dancing is happening, like a rainbow. Sounds very spectacular. With this event, it's quite a straightforward one in that we're all going to play as our own crew member. In some other events, you might play as a passenger or or other other kind of characters, but we're definitely just going to play as our own characters. Uh, Did you want to introduce your character, Rich? I used to be the hired muscle, a bear folk, mostly because the hired muscle has a not Wookiee on it, and I love it. (laughs) So the hired muscle who now... He's the chef. During his time as a hunter, he was known as as Plessy because branding. All that he's held onto from those days is his Life Day medal and a pair of shock knuckles, which he still wears even while cooking. But he did find an automated whisk, and he wears a chef's hat, so that should make him look the part. Amazing. And Jason, who will you be playing? So I'm going to play as the actual bounty hunter. He's taken a bit of a fall from grace, and he's now the janitor on the ship. Oof. I'm playing as a Valk, which is a bird-like species with piercing eyes. And despite my kind of uh, fall from grace, I still have a working jetpack and a battered helmet, which I still wear all the time. Plus a kind of a baggy hazmat suit that I wear underneath the helmet just to ensure that I'm protected from whatever the passengers create that I need to clean up afterwards. 
And just to go into my fluff for Curtis, I am a typical human with friendly eyes. What I've taken from those days of being a hacker is an uh, autonomous drone, and I have a pair of augmented spectacles. I'm still a risk taker as a bartender, but I'm slightly more committed now. And I've also got a waterproof apron and a universal translator, which might be helpful on this cruise. <laughs> a waterproof apron. That's great. On our ship, we've actually gained a couple of items. We've managed to scrounge them together as we put our ship together. So we've got a jukebox as a useful item that we can use to, however it might be useful. And we've also managed to acquire some shrinking goo. I don't know where we got it from, but if you put this goo on something, it will make it a lot smaller than it was before. Shrink it right down to size. So you can only use these once, but if you do decide to use them, we'll get a bonus at the end of the event for, for making use of our resources. Now we're going to... Enter the event part of the main event, starting with the lead character, take turns answering questions until all five have been answered. The question that really speaks to me is what special drink is only being served for one night? I think there is a cocktail that gets set on fire and the fire burns in these colors that are meant to invoke that supernova rainbow display we're going to be flying past. Does anyone want to answer the next question? Yeah, I'm happy to go. And what makes the food this evening extra special? So I think in my role as the janitor, I think what I've managed to do is slip a little truth serum into the uh, tacos that are being put out for everybody. Oh, no. Yeah, I just think I just feel like causing some mischief. I'm not happy with the way the sports team have been uh, have been taking care of the ship. And I want to see, uh, see what juicy gossip we can get out of them. I'll take what music is playing during the evening. Blossy the Grumble Bear doesn't really want romantic music so chosen a, a leap hop, it's a lot more danceable and these guys are athletes. They can get up and move a bit. So yeah, that's what's playing. It's a very bouncy, energetic style of music. What are the entire crew wearing for one night? Oh, we're dressed up in jerseys from the sports team, aren't we? We're <sighs> really leaning in. It's uncomfortable. Okay, and I think in that case, the kind of dance we host, it probably can't be ballroom, can it, given what we're wearing? No. Not at all. I think we're just going to go for a straight up rave with like glow sticks. You know, <laughs> I think the idea that this, this huge neon explosion is going to happen outside the ship as the big finale would just really suit that idea of uh, being at like a, you know, some music festival somewhere. And, and the, the, Excellent. Yeah, let's go with that. So now we enter the complication. The lead player must describe a short scene where they deal with a complicating situation. So generally in complications, you get to choose from one of two choices. Often mm -hmm. you deal with it together or with a partner. But in this case, it's down to you. So whatever resource is available to you. Okay. Someone aboard the ship displays a strange symptom of a rare infectious disease. Provide immediate treatment or somehow quarantine the unfortunate person before it spreads too far. I think Cheeto, who is very earnest, is going to think for a moment that he is suffering from the space version of seasickness. I think that's called space madness. I don't know if it's space madness. That That's different than seasickness. <laughs> Fine. I just wanted to have space madness. We could put space madness in. I mean, it could be a colloquial term. Yeah. So he's getting a little bit unwell, uneasy. Curtis has seen this type of nonsense before, perhaps at some point when we were on a deep space mission and Plussy went a little bit, you know, suffered from a little bit of space sickness, space madness, as it were. And the last time he saw, or Curtis solved this problem for Plussy, he put together cocktails that would taste medicinal. If it's space madness, therefore it, it requires a psychological response, <laughs> right? A big placebo. You, a placebo. If you think you're drinking medicine, it works like medicine, right? <laughs> Great. So I think using the drone to go collect items from around the ship, the plus one forward, he is going to concoct this elixir that will hopefully stabilize Cheeto before the rest of the team figures out something is going horribly awry. And then we move on to the next part, restarting the party. All the other crew members should choose one question and describe a short scene. Yeah, so after, after Cheeto's little uh, episode there, uh, we basically need to get the party started again. 
I can answer the first question. How do you get the music going again and get the crew dancing? So I'm going to use our useful item here, which is the jukebox. I think uh, I'm stood over there with my mop and bucket. I'm just going to give it a quick kick and get the jukebox running again. This kind of battered old jukebox that we've managed to drag out of a bin somewhere. And as soon as the jukebox starts rolling again, the disco lights start flashing, the glow sticks are handed out again, and the whole crew just quickly forget Cheeto's episode and put it down to, you know, that's just typical Cheeto. Ah, well, how do you get the kitchen back in order? And what do you serve for dessert? Seems like a thing the chef should answer. Hmm. He walks around looking intimidating, ordering all of his kitchen staff, all three of them, to get back to work, grumbling as he is wont to do, and berating them angrily. It's only going to get worse if you stand here gawking. And I think that the kitchen crew hustles back to the kitchen, gets to work making a blueberry tart for dessert. And that really fits the kind of classy thing we're going for this evening, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> it's a blueberry sauvage tart, though. So there you go. It's dangerous. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. And then we move on to Resolution, the lead player. So in which case, me. Roll three dice, up to three dice. Start with one just for luck. So I've got our first die. Did anyone use an experience? Yeah, Rich used one of his. Yeah. And yeah. when I cross out that experience, when I use it as well, right? And once you've used your hunter experience, you would cross it out and you would no longer have that available to you. And you'd actually get to pick a new experience from the host ones. So oh, this, cool. This kind of signifies the passing of time on the ship. And as you give up your old life over time, you get better at the new life. But you would get to pick a new one. And then obviously that's available to you in the next event. And then finally, if anyone used the useful item, which I think we did with the jukebox. Yes. Yeah, I gave it a good kick to get the party started again. So to figure out our resolution, I am going to roll these three D6s. And then go with the highest result. So the highest result is actually a five. I never roll high with my characters. Crazy. I, I testify that you never roll well. It's all fives, Rich. It's 15. But we <laughs> don't count the dice that way in this game. Our resolution is an ode to joy. The dance was a huge success. And the delirious passengers retire back to their cabins with linked arms. Describe and add a useful item to the ship. This should represent a gift from the passengers to the crew. Oh, we 100% have a jersey signed by the whole team. We can put it in a frame, hang it up on the wall at a place of pride. I'm sure that will become important on a future mission. Uh, I mean, a future cruise. Cruise! <laughs> so I'm going to add it to the ship. A signed sports team jersey. Probably with a little bit of vomit stain from Cheeto. <laughs> Don't think about that part too hard. And who knows, maybe in future that Having that uh, iconic thing hanging somewhere in the bar will actually help us to impress a passenger. That's a very quick run through of one of the more simple events, basically. They all follow a similar pattern of some opening questions, mm -hmm. um, kind of the mm -hmm. main event that's happening and, and sort of setting that up, something going wrong, and then resolving it based on you using the resources available to you and obviously the skills that your characters individually have. That's really cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Jason, thank you so much for running us through some a complicated profession. I appreciated this main event. No problem. Thank you. It was really, really fun to talk through the game and uh, to give it a go. If our listeners want to follow your work online, where can they find you? So I'm on Twitter at alwayscheckers, and my itch store is alwayscheckers.itch.io. So that's where you can find all my games and send me any messages if you want to speak to me. Thanks again, Jason, for coming on Plus One Forward and being part of our summer series about Firebrand's game. Thanks so much for having me. I hope it goes well. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community Richard Rogers and Rach Schelke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aro Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aro Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com.
You can now get Hearts of Wulin Worlds on Drive-Thru RPG. This supplement for Hearts of Wulin includes alternate settings and new mechanics. In it you'll find Shadow of the Joseon, a historical Korean setting, 1905 San Francisco, Chinatown in the shadow of the Chinese Exclusion Act, Corps de la Epée, a fantastic swashbuckling France, Academy of the Blade, an anime-inspired dueling school, Fight Me IRL, a cyberpunk corporatized future, and Silk and Steam, a silk punk fantasy setting. As well, Hearts of Wulin Worlds contains a new core playbook, detailed options for running Wuxia Mysteries, and more. You can get the PDF, as well as the core Hearts of Wulin book, at our drive through publisher site, bit.ly forward slash gauntlet hyphen publishing.